Excellent. It's very bright up here. All right. Hello. Thank you all for being here um, and for participating in what has been a genuinely energizing few days of discussion and shared inquiry. In a way, what we have been doing together is not dissimilar to Victor Frankenstein's task. Coming together from our apparently mutually exclusive disciplines, we have stitched together our shared interest in this so rich of texts. Just as Shelley herself also did in bringing together in her novel her enthusiasms about philosophy, theology, history, literary and otherwise, science and technology, the classical tradition, and so many others. This symposium exists to remind us of what we share from our disparate departments and offices, classrooms, and labs. We share a common interest, a mission as educators and as thinkers that commits us to intellectual inquiry, rigorous thinking, and a continued wonder at the place of humanity in the world. It is this shared interest that produces an intellectual community, and these two days have shown us, I believe, that community at its best. Before introducing our speaker, I would like to say a few words by way of recognition and gratitude. First, to Colleen Grant, the winner of our student poster contest. Is Colleen here? No, no, okay. Um, well, we'll just talk about her in her absence. Um, <laughs> Colleen's image, that ubiquitous eye, if any of you know her, like please tell her that we all talked about her. Um, Colleen's image, that ubiquitous eye staring at us and at passersby on Charles Street, gets something perfectly right about Shelley's novel, the horror of seeing an eye made by human hands and the even greater horror of recognizing that that eye is looking back at us with what Mary Shelley calls a speculative gaze a gaze that knows and thinks the stuff of nightmares. I also highly encourage, and if any of you are here, I also highly encourage looking at the other fabulous poster submissions that line the hallway out this way. Each of these tremendous accomplishments gives a new way to see Shelley's novel. And on behalf of the symposium, I thank all who entered the contest. The Humanities Symposium began more than 20 years ago and through the sponsorship of the Humanities Center, currently under the direction of Professor Paul Lucas, it has continued this week. It is the sponsorship of the Humanities Center that makes the week of symposium events possible, but it is the participation of all of you, students and faculty alike, that makes it a success. And we thank each of you for sharing your time and your thoughts. Also, nothing much would be possible at all without the sanity and profound abilities of Patty Ingram, I think is over there somewhere, right? Hi. <laughs> Whose tireless, tireless work has brought us books to read, movies to watch, space in which to talk to each other, and a general sense of what could be done and how. Finally, though I am addressing you now, I am the assistant director of this symposium, which means I've had the luxury of participating and contributing without being the one on the line. The lion's share of the work the work of conceptualizing, organizing, and bringing this symposium to fruition has been that of the director, Professor Steve Hughes of the, of the History Department. From appearing publicly in a monster mask to inspire enthusiasm, to having the patience and forethought to arrange the days we have just experienced, Professor Hughes, our fearless leader, our symposiarch, has brought us here together. While we shall likely raise our glasses to him at dinner, we owe him now, I think, a round of applause. As the culminating event of our shared week in Frankensteinia, we are delighted and honored to welcome Professor N. Catherine Hales, professor in the program in literature at Duke University. There is not a chance I would be able to tell you all of Professor Hale's accomplishments in the time we have allotted, even if she herself were not to address us. She has held positions at numerous illustrious institutions, including UCLA, the University of Iowa, Dartmouth, and in an odd coincidence, early in her career, the University of Missouri Rala, which just happens to be my hometown. <laughs> she has received awards and recognition for her distinguished work, both nationally and internationally, including honorary degrees both in this country and in Sweden. She is an example of a truly accomplished scholar, 
a thinker whose work has inspired countless readers and has invited us to rethink our relationship to literature, science, and media technology. Having worked as a research chemist before turning to the study of literature, media, and technology, Professor Hale's scholarship exemplifies the ideals we celebrate in our commitment to the Humanities Symposium. Radically interdisciplinary, her work engages scientific and literary practice, as well as the theories and ideas underlying that practice at the highest levels. Exploring the ways that the means of our access to the world around us, our media, affects our understanding of our position within that world, Hale's work has been immeasurably valuable to the effort to think about our current moment, providing insight into the interrelation of literature, science, technology, and that most crucial phenomenon, the digital age in which we live. Some of her recent books, How We Became Post-Human, Writing Machines, and Electronic Literature, New Horizons for the Literary, have won prizes for, respectively, the best book in literary theory and in science fiction, outstanding scholarship in the ecology of symbolic form, and an award of excellence offered for books of scholarly reference. Her most recent book, My Mother Was a Computer, reminds us of the degree to which our, actually, well, second most recent book, My Mother Was a Computer, reminds us of the degree to which our relationship to the world is conditioned by our language, and subsequently the ways our language becomes ever increasingly indistinguishable from that of computers and digital media. Her newest book, How We Think, Transforming Power and Digital Technologies, invites the humanities to consider the ways that, as she puts it, digital technologies are changing the ways in which we think, read, write, and imagine. Demonstrating throughout her work what one reviewer calls both historical gravity and ethical intelligence, Professor Hales is, in short, a thinker's thinker. She is also, however, a thinker whose commitment and willingness to work to make sense of the world in which we live and the ways we access and understand it through our bodies, our minds, and our souls remind us of why thinking matters and why it is worth doing. Professor Hales combines the scale of her impressive intertextual and interdisciplinary erudition with that re most remarkable of talents to couple with a profound mind, the ability to remain deeply, warmly human. Her talk this evening is entitled Frankenstein and Media Specific Analysis. Please join me in welcoming Professor Ann Catherine Hales. Thank you, Aaron. Well, I, I'd like to thank Aaron for that uh, lovely introduction to which I cannot possibly live up. Uh, but in any event, I also wanted to locate myself in relation to the rich uh, set of discussions that you've had yesterday and today and throughout the week. I was a little surprised to get this invitation because I am not a romanticist. Most of my work has been in the late 20th and 21st century. And I asked Erin about that at lunch, and she said, uh, well, the idea behind the symposium is that everyone is a little out of her comfort zone. So I confess to being a lot out of my comfort zone uh, here talking to you about Frankenstein. Uh, but I, would, um, I uh, would like to apply a technique that I have been arguing for in other contexts to Frankenstein as well as to another work by Shelley Jackson called Patchwork Girl and see how far we can get if we adopt as our focus the materiality of the work. So of course Frankenstein is a print book. But uh, any print book, including this one, is not a standalone artifact. It's embedded in a network of booksellers, publishers, technology, legal copyright uh, decisions, and so forth. Um, but we might nevertheless ask what we can learn if we focus on the material aspects of the text. So some of those aspects are so obvious to us that they seem almost invisible or trivial. For example, the pages, the fact that the pages are numbered and that they're numbered sequentially, we take that so for granted we don't even notice it. 
And yet that simple numbering device has some significant implications. It implies linear reading, but at the same time the book uh, represented a very different technology than the scroll precisely because it allows random access. You can open it at any point, flip forward, flip backward, unlike the continuous unrolling or rolling of a scroll. You probably know that the 1818 edition, which I understand is the edition you've been reading for the symposium, was first uh, published anonymously without Mary Shelley's name on the title page. And it wasn't until the 1823 edition, an image of which we just saw, that uh, Mary Shelley added her name. The 1818 edition was also published in a kind of standard three-decker um, configuration of three volumes. By the 1923 edition, that had shrunk to two volumes, and of course in 1931, only one volume, although those volume markers continue as typographic characteristics in, uh, our, no in our edition. So the second convention we might notice are typographic conventions. And it's the typographic uh, conventions that alert us to the fact that when we open the novel, we're reading a series of letters written, we learn, by Robert Walton to uh, his sister. And at uh, the point of the publication of this novel, 1818, the conventions of the novel were still in formation. <coughs> And uh, for those early novels, it struck people as strange that you could open a book and just start reading. So many early novels have devices to explain the existence of the novel as a written artifact. And Walton's letters perform that service here. Letters are documents, they could be kept, his journal could be kept. So Mary Shelley opens her narrative with a device that explains for us how a written document could come into existence. Although, of course, the book that we read is not a manuscript, but a print book. So in this first frame of Walton's letters, uh, we get place markers, archangel, for example, and although the Arctic Ocean isn't mentioned, uh, we can infer that also from the context. Another typographic convention we might not notice is the fact that in Walton's letters, Victor Frankenstein's um, discourse is in quotation marks, marking a different speaker other than Walton, who is the narrator at this point. But when Walton begins his journal, those quotation marks disappear. And Victor's narration is now in the first person as though he were speaking to us. And of course, we know from the, from the narrative that this is Walton's transcription of Victor's uh, narration. But nevertheless, it presents to us as an autobiography. So we actually have three autobiographies in this text. We have the autobiography represented by Walton's letters. We have Victor's autobiography. And then later, we will, of course, get the creature's autobiography as well. The second frame is Frankenstein's uh, narration. And this is how it breaks down by volume. You may not have noticed this uh, reading sequentially. But volume one tells about the creature's uh, creation, his abandonment, and ends with the death of William and Justine. Volume two is dominated by the creature's narration and volume three by the creation of the female creature, her destruction, and the aftermath of that, fading out at the end again to the first frame of Walton, which is marked in our text, Walton in Continuation. So these three narrative frames provide us with a basis for comparison and contrast. The first comparison we might note is between Walton and Frankenstein. Walton is ambitious. He is on what he sees as a heroic quest to discover the North Pole. But he's also blind to the costs of that quest. So he is endangering the lives of the men who are accompanying him. And towards the end of the narrative, they uh, extract a promise from him that he won't continue on this quest 
if the ship is free. So there are some morally questionable aspects about his quest that makes us uh, wonder if this kind of quest is actually worth the cost. But those reservations are minor with Walton, and it's with Victor that they really come uh, into very sharp focus. In Victor's, in kind of evaluating Victor's character, we have some staggeringly uh, obtuse actions on his part. So obtuse, we might wonder how he could possibly be so blind. So inexplicably, he doesn't realize that the monster is hideous until it's animated. He thinks nothing of the cost to the monster of abandoning him on the night of his creation. And then most inexplicably, when the monster tells him, I will be with you on your wedding night, it never seems to occur to him there are two people on his <laughs> wedding night, that Elizabeth is involved as well, and of course she will pay with her life. So we have these actions, and if we only had the actions, we might judge Victor, as some people said today, as the most reprehensible character in the text. And yet I think many readers do not evaluate uh, Victor in that way. Why not? This is where the effect of Walton's frame becomes crucial. Walton sees Victor as heroic, aristocratic, in his essence as a noble, good person. And we get that evaluation of Victor before we see Victor's actions. So we're primed, as it were, to think of Victor as an essentially good person who just happened to have this staggeringly bad luck. And another blindness of Victor is illustrated here in the frontispiece to the 1831 edition, and that's the fact that he makes the monster huge. Now he explains that by saying, well, it's really hard to work on little tiny body parts, so I had to make them pretty big, but it never seems to have occurred to him that to make the monster seven or eight feet high might make it difficult for him to be integrated into society. <laughs> so now if we compare Victor with the creature, I think that the creature comes out rather better than Victor. So Victor has an idyllic childhood. Uh, he's loved by his parents, he's given every indulgence, but the effect of that idyllic childhood is that it allows him to take his family and friends for granted. That he seems to display a habit of leaving them when he wants, and then when he needs support, he returns home. Now if we compare that with the creature, the creature has no such support, not only doesn't have an idyllic childhood, has a childhood full of hardship, he desperately needs parenting, but Victor gives him none. He's new to the world, but he doesn't have the advantage of being a child and allowing, being allowed a child's latitude to learn and to grow. He has no companion, and there are a few places in the text where it's suggested that he is a new species, not entirely human. So not only does he have no companion, he has no fellow species. But now, interestingly, like Victor, the creature is good in his own eyes. He's essentially good. He's forced into evil actions by others. And like Victor, in the final portion when he's talking to Walton, he expresses remorse for his actions. And just like Victor, he's quick to offer excuses for the horrific murders that he's carried out. So in an eerie way, the creature mirrors some of Victor's worst faults, comes out rather better on other aspects. Hmm, here we go. All right, so uh, I mentioned earlier the uh, frame of the letters, 
And of course, letters have an addressee. And here again, we get a kind of mirror relationship between Walton and Victor. Walton is writing to his sister. Victor, Victor is writing to his childhood friend and bride-to-be, Elizabeth. And of course, she writes back to him. And through these letters, we implicitly begin to construct a hierarchical gender relationship. So men travel, women stay home, men have adventures, women worry about them. And then, uh, somewhat inexplicably to me at least, Victor, who deeply loves Elizabeth, decides to take off on a tour of the continent for two years before they uh, marry. And moreover, he makes this decision without consulting her, although she agrees after the fact that this will be all right. Now, we know, of course, that he has in mind the uh, promise he made to the creature to um, fabricate a female creature, a mate for him. But nevertheless, he seems to take his good time about that and have lots of fun visiting fun places. In the 1831 uh, preface, um, the most famous line in that preface uh, is this, I bid my hideous progeny go forth and prosper. So now moving from the frames to the author who is sort of the outer, uh, outermost possible frame, we might ask what are the reference for hideous progeny? The most obvious one, of course, is the creature, Frankenstein's creature. But in another sense, we might say that the novel itself is her hideous progeny. And in still another sense, as Barbara Johnson has pointed out, this is Mary Shelley's first novel. So in writing this novel, she was also giving birth to herself as a writer. And therefore, she is implicated in the hideous progeny in a number of somewhat disturbing ways. We know, of course, there are three editions of Frankenstein published during Mary Shelley's lifetime. And again, a, a fact so obvious we may not even notice it is that it's printing technologies which require the clear delineation between editions. Compared to digital text, a blog that can change daily, it's because the printing press had to set type. Once the type is set, multiple copies are run off. Then after those copies are run off, the type is dispersed again so it can be used with other text. Just this uh, mundane reality of how printing took place means you could not have continuous transformations of the text. And until uh, recently, with Charles Robinson's facsimile edition, the only people who had access to the manuscript from which the print book was set had to go to the Bodleian Library, get permission, and so forth. But now with the facsimile edition, it's possible for anyone to study uh, the manuscript from which the book was created. And that has uh, resulted in some settling of long disputes among scholars. So the manuscript notebooks contain not only Mary Shelley's uh, fair copy, but also the alterations that Percy Bysshe Shelley made in her manuscript. So apparently, Mary Shelley gave her husband, Percy, carte blanche to revise whatever he wanted in the manuscript. And here we see what the facsimile edition looks like. You have the manuscript page with things crossed out, emendations. The next column is a typescript of Mary Shelley's uh, manuscript. And then on the other side, we get Percy Bysshe Shelley in a different type font. So as a result of this work, we now know that Percy Biss was a minor collaborator with Mary Shelley. Many people had suggested that he had a much larger role in Frankenstein than this. But he wrote about 5,000 out of the total 70,000 words, or about 7% of the book uh, was by him. Most astonishingly, we learned from the 1831 preface that the 1818 preface was written entirely by Percy Bysshe Shelley. 
And that's surprising because it's written as though it is said in the voice of Mary. And one passage in particular from that 1818 preface strikes me as perhaps characteristic of Percy Shelley. So recounting the origin of the four companions, the ghost story contest and so forth, the um, narrator of the preface, which we now know is Percy and not Mary, uh, says this, that among these was a writer, a tale from the pen, pen of one of whom would be far more acceptable to the public than anything I can ever hope to produce. Now the obvious referent for that is Lord Byron, but I sort of suspect that Shelley had himself in mind when uh, he wrote these words. Now if we look at Mary Shelley's biography just in a quick uh, sketch, we can begin to see uh, both some of the raw emotional power that uh, lies behind Frankenstein, but also I think something about her relationship to her husband. So we know that uh, her mother died in, from complications from childbirth uh, because of Mary's birth. And we also know that Mary didn't learn of the actual cause of her mother's death until she was something like 10 or 11. That is, just about to begin menstruation and enter into womanhood herself, she now learns that uh, she was indirectly the cause of her mother's death. And she had the habit of going to the cemetery, reading and writing in her journal on her mother's tombstone, in fact, had some trysts with Percy uh, at that tombstone. Just before she turns 17, she elopes with Shelley, who by that time was a married man with two children. So the elopement caused a tremendous scandal, and as a result, Mary and Percy left England and spent several years in a kind of rootless uh, journey across various European countries. Mary had eventually five children. Four of those died uh, very young. And so it wasn't until Percy Florence that she actually had a child that survived into adulthood. And then in 1822, Percy Shelley himself uh, drowned in an accident on a lake. So by the time she was 25, Mary Shelley had experienced five devastating deaths more than many people experience in their lifetime. If we think about Mary's relationship with Percy, it seems clear from a number of, uh, number of different kinds of evidence that he was the dominant partner in this relationship. When Mary eloped with him, just turning uh, 17, she was uh, the daughter of two famous parents, but had done nothing of note herself. He was already a celebrated, established poet. He was older than she was, more worldly than she was. Uh, so we can understand that he became for her a kind of uh, fetishized figure of fascination. And she was willing to subordinate herself to him. But as the uh, relationship continued, his wife committed suicide, which enabled them to marry, uh, it became clear to Mary and subsequently to her biographers that Percy had a number of affairs, including one with Claire Claremont, uh, her uh, stepsister. And at the same time, he encouraged her to have platonic affairs, that is, to have romantic attachments to men with the provision that there not be any sex, a condition, of course, he himself did not observe. So her marriage was difficult, to say the least, and yet she never lost her uh, affection and even sense of awe for her husband. And the inequality in their gender relations, I think, is evident to us uh, merely from the 1831 edition, if from no other source. So here she recounts how she came to maturity as a writer. My husband was from the very first very anxious that I should prove myself worthy of my parentage and enroll myself on the page of fame. He was forever inciting me to obtain literary reputation, 
which even on my own part I cared for then, though since I've become infinitely indifferent to it. At that time he desired that I should write not so much with the idea that I could produce anything worthy of notice, but that he might himself judge how far I possessed the promise of better things thereafter. So you can see that it's Percy who has the literary taste, Percy who is the judge, Mary who is the judged, and who is desperately trying to attain a status her husband already had. And then we get uh, the continuation of the preface with that very famous line I mentioned earlier. But let's look uh, a little more at this because it'll come up later. I have affection for it, for it was the offspring of happy days, when death and grief were but words which found no true echo in my heart. Its several pages speak of many a walk, many a drive, and many a conversation when I was not alone, and my companion was one who, in this world, I shall never see more. And this is written, of course, after his death. But this is for myself. My readers have nothing to do with these associations. Now this sets us up to take a look at Shelley Jackson's uh, digital hypertext called Patchwork Girl. And uh, Shelley Jackson is riffing uh, extensively on Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, as we'll see in a moment. This is the opening graphic for uh, Patchwork Girl. You can see that the body is transected by dotted lines, and there is a large line going transversally across the image. And we understand a couple of things from this image. First of all, that the body is seamed, ruptured, multiple. And secondly, that this is a representation of the female monster that Victor dismembers in a fit of sexual nausea. You recall that he is, is assembling the female body, has various reservations, but the, the one that really clinches it for him is the idea that the female and male monster will have sex. And if they have sex, then they have babies. And if they have babies, then this might be the creation of a new species more powerful than humans and therefore spell the end of the human race. And at that point, Victor tears the body apart. It doesn't seem to have occurred to him that he could have made the monster without reproductive organs. <laughs> so uh, there's a kind of psychological subtext here of sexual nausea that, um, that Shelley Jackson is picking up on. So she reassembles the female monster and makes it the main narrator of her text. And here we get a little sketch on the title page of the main textual segments of this digital hypertext, a graveyard which tells the story of the women whose body parts went together to make up the female monster. And interestingly, these women do not lose their body uh, do not lose their identity when they contribute their parts to the monster. So the monster is more an assemblage than a coherent uh, body or subjectivity. Journal is written by Mary Shelley, and it tells about her creation of the female monster. So now it's not Victor who is creating the female monster, but Mary Shelley herself. A quilt, which is a kind of pastiche of different kinds of textual passages, a story which is the monster's narration, and then some miscellaneous uh, parts. So it's clear that Shelley Jackson had in mind that the female monster would represent a different kind of subjectivity than that on display in Mary Shelley's book. So in an essay accompanying the hypertext that she published about the same time, she says this, the body is a patchwork though the stitches might not show. It's run by committee, a loose aggregate of entities we can't really call human, but which have what look like lives of a sort. These parts are certainly not what we think of as objects, nor are they simple appendages. So she has a number of ways to illustrate this, including the fact that plant DNA is now found in the 
now known to be in the cells of uh, animals and so forth. But the idea here is that the monster's body is not abnormal. The monster's body is, in fact, typical in more exaggerated form of what everybody is. This is the way the text looks in the map view of the proprietary story space software. And each of these blocks can be opened by clicking on the title. And then you'll notice that several of them have smaller blocks of Lexia within them. So the next graphic we encounter is uh, this one. Now the monster's body, which was known to be seamed before, begins to be dispersed. And you'll notice that dividing the rectangles is the dotted line that also appeared on the body in the first graphic. So the Lexia dotted line sort of explains the significance of this, um, this uh, written signifier. The dotted line is the best line because it allows differences without cleaving apart for good what it distinguishes. Moreover, in this text, the dotted line is, triggered, is treated like a dotted line on an origami figure that would allow you to fold the figure up out of a flat plane into three dimensions. So the dotted line is associated with the narrative strategy that Gerard uh, Jeanette calls metalepsis. That is a confusion of diegetic levels. So in this text, Mary Shelley is both the author of the text, but at the same time, a character within the text. Now, logically, those should be distinct, but in this text, they're kind of conflated together. And we see that in the two linked lexias called sewn and written. And in here, you see the way that that uh, confusion of diegetic levels is, handed, is handled. So in the written lexia, we get Mary Shelley as author creating her monster by writing. I had made her writing deep in the night by candlelight until the tiny black letters blurred into stitches. And I began to feel that I was sewing a great quilt. So we go there from writing to sewing. And in sewing, we make the opposite transformation. I had sewn her, stitching deep in the night by candlelight. Now, if she's sewing the monster, that means she's within the fiction that in another sense she's writing, but you see the way now that's conflated until the tiny black stitches wavered into script and I began to feel that I was writing, that this creature I was assembling was a brash attempt to achieve by artificial means the unity of a life form. So um, in every possible way, Mary Shelley, as she's treated in Shelley Jackson's text, uh, is the antithesis of Victor Frankenstein. She's modest. She wonders there if, uh, if she's exceeding her boundaries. Uh, at the end of this passage, she calls herself authoress, a kind of diminutive term, not an author. So she's not hubristic. She's not uh, ambitious. She stays with the monster. She nurtures the monster. And when the monster leaves her, she exults in the monster's freedom and physical strength, quite a contrast to Victor. And Jackson is throughout drawing an analogy between the ruptured form of the monster's body and the ruptured form of the textual body of a hypertext and furthermore, reading both of those in gendered terms. The banished body is not female necessarily, but it is feminine. That is, it is amorphous, indirect, impure, diffuse, multiple, evasive. So is what we learn to call bad writing. Good writing is direct, effect, clean as effective, clean as a bleached bone. Bad writing is all flesh and dirty flesh at that. So she's actually here reversing the valuations of that and suggesting that what people have called good writing is not good writing. What may be better writing is feminine or hypertextual writing. 
One of Shelley Jackson's boldest move comes in Alexia called Thanks. Interestingly, you do not see this Lexia in the map view, which is the view that most people use with story space. But it shows up in the chart view. And it has an explosive implication. In the hypertext, it's linked to that passage in the 1831 preface about the lost companion. But notice what happens to the referent of the lost companion. Thanks, Mary, for that kindness, however tinged with disgust. Hideous progeny. Yes, I was both those things for you and more. Lover, friend, collaborator. So uh, Mary and her monster have an erotic relationship, which they symbolize by cutting a piece of skin off their thighs and exchanging it. So. Mary's skin is sewn onto the monster, and the monster's skin is uh, sewn onto Mary. So uh, what has happened now is that Mary Shelley in Shelley Jackson's work is still married to Percy Bysshe Shelley, but she finds in her relationship to the monster something that her husband cannot offer her, which is equality, female companionship, a kind of pleasure in each other's accomplishments. And in Shelley Jackson's work, it's the monster who provides Mary Shelley with that, not her husband. When the monster comes to consider what part of her flesh she might exchange for Mary, with Mary, she decides significantly to use the part where a seam occurs. All the skin surfaces belong to other people, but it's in the join that uh, allows her to call that her, her, her own. And this is immediately related to the form of the hypertext. My real skeleton is made of scars, a web that traverses me in three dimensions, which is exactly the story space um, image. What holds me together is what marks my dispersal. I am most myself in the gaps between my parts. Now that's really interesting. She's most herself in the gaps between her parts. So the parts in the hypertext are the lexias. But the lexias are connected by links, instantaneous passages from one lexia to another. And at one point, the monster begins asking, where am I in the gap? How do I exist as a subject in the gap? And she imagines that she might be dissolved into a seethe of molecules down into the computer. So what's emerging from this is a radically different vision of subjectivity than we get in Mary Shelley's romantic novel. Moreover, it's radically different from Mary Shelley's print novel because this is a digital work and therefore underlain by executable code. And in this image, which we looked at before, if you look at the upper left corner, you can just make out some writing, which we read just enough of to realize it's a passage from the story space manual. So the image is pointing to the fact that the screenic surface is always generated by underlying code mediated by such things as manuals. And that means that authorship in this work is deliberately conceived of as always already multiple. If you remember that title page, it said Mary slash Shelley. So Shelley Jackson's playing on the name that she shares with Mary Shelley and herself. And herself refers to the female monster. Um, but another a uh, collaborator in that writing is the computer. So in this passage, we get a comment on thinking. It thinks. There is a kind of thinking without thinkers. Matter thinks. Language thinks. When we have business with language, we are possessed by its dreams and demons. We grow intimate with monsters. And of course, in another context, the computer is sort of the ultimate monster that is creating this text. We get a vivid image of that collaborative sense in the Alexia called Body Jungle. 
where the monster is now inside another huge body. And as she looks around, she sees beating hearts roost like pheasants on high bone branches. Ovaries hang like kumquats from delicate vines. And then we get this passage. My bony stumps will sink deep. I will shuffle forward until I tire, then stand still. I will place the end of a vein in my mouth and suck it. At last, I will no longer bother to remove it. I do not know how my skull will open or if I will still know myself when my brain drifts up to join the huge, intelligent sky. So this relates to that uh, question she asked, where is her subjectivity in the gaps? And this seems to suggest that it's in some other intelligent entity, probably the computer. Now we might ask like a, a, how a hypertext like this that allows even more random access than the book can be read in any order, uh, kind of defies linear sequentiality, how it can possibly end. And throughout the hypertext, we've gotten a dynamic of coherence on the one hand and fragmentation on the other. This reaches a climax in a scene in which the body of the monster begins to come apart in a violently explosive fashion. The monster has offered, since she herself doesn't have a past, to buy a past from a woman named Elsie, who finds her in the bathroom in this moment of crisis, bathtub, and begins to hold her, and the monster feels something different in that embrace. I was gathered together loosely in her attention in a way that was interesting for me, for I was all in pieces yet not apart. I felt permitted. I began to invent something new, a way to hang together without pretending I was whole. And this could be read as a kind of aesthetic manifesto for the kind of writing that Shelley Jackson is both doing and exploring in this hypertext. Now let's go back to the question of the specificity of media. And we get here, juxtapose the story space map view with a, a page of manuscript from the facsimile uh, notebooks. So we might notice immediately uh, the difference between how one would create such a manuscript page and how one would create something like that story space map view. So Friedrich Kipler in his book, uh, Discourse Networks 1800-1900, has argued that there was a physical, a spiritual, and a psychological transformation in the movement from manuscript culture to what he called technical media. So manuscripts, he argued, are deeply tied in with the kinesthetic sensation of writing. The feedback loop between the hand and the brain makes the writer feel that the voice of the writer is flowing onto the page. And when that becomes a print book, the readers feel they are hearing the voice of the author in the writing. With technical media, Kittler argued, a different kind of relationship between writing and subjectivity was established. It broke the connection with handwriting, the hand, the hand and the brain loop, and instead began to introduce different kinds of mediations in such media as the photograph, the phonograph, and now, of course, the digital computer. And the result of that, Kittler argues, was to uh, radically transform the romantic sensibility of a direct connection with nature, which is so much on display in Mary Shelley's book. And Kittler points out that in the, early, uh, in the early 19th century, reading was customarily taught to children by having their mother read to them. And so the mother's voice becomes a kind of remembered memory and resonance that then is associated with mother nature. So mother nature speaks, speaks with a voice made uh, resonant by all of the layered memories of the child listening to his mother read. But toward the end of the 19th century, phonics was introduced. And at that point, children learned to read 
not by having their mother read to them, but by sounding out the letters. And the result of that, Kittler argues, was to disenchant or to break the deep bond between human and nature that is so much a part of the romantic sensibility. Now we heard this morning, and I take it yesterday as well, something about the sublime, which is so much a part of the romantic imagination of nature. And if we think about where the sublime landscapes occur in Mary Shelley's novel, Victor will often go out on the lake, climb a mountain in order to experience the terror and the awesomeness of the sublime. But the monster then intrudes on those landscapes. So it's when he's in the most sublime landscapes that Victor sees the monster scampering up the steep mountain or um, on the glacier. And so the monster is intruding into the natural sublime. And I'd like to suggest that the monster represents the technological sublime, an idea that's been developed by David Nye and Joseph Tabby, among others. That the monster is also sublime, but sublime not because he is an awesome work of nature, rather precisely because he is an artificial life form. And in this sense, we might see the monster as generations of critic, critics have of uh, beginning to inaugurate an era of the technological sublime when it is the awesome achievements of technology that stand in for the sublimity of a natural landscape. In Shelley Jackson's rewriting of Mary Shelley's work, she uh, makes explicit much of what is implicit in Shelley's text, gender relations, distributed cognition, fragmented subjectivity. And she deliberately draws that contrast between manuscript and print versus digital hypertext and networked and programmable media. So as we move from the era of manuscript transformed into print text, into digital hypertext, or more generally, networked and programmable media, this transformation of writing technologies is going along with the emergence of the technological sublime. And it's that connection, I think, that makes Shelley's Jackson's uh, work so resonant and so interesting. With that, I'll conclude and thank you. And I would be glad to take any comments or questions you may have. Can we bring up the lights so that we can see the audience? Is that possible? We bring up the lights? Oh, they're working on it. All right. OK, as long as they're there we go. All right. <laughs> is it? Ah, there it is. In terms of what you have said, what do you see is the future of the book? The book as a, a reality, not this book, but the book itself. Yes. Well, um, there is a strange kind of paradox at work here, I think, that many people have written about the death of the book. I think that's hogwash. In fact, what we're seeing is a tremendous resurgence of interest in the book, in artist books, in exper experimental fiction, and so forth. And it's almost as though the book has been relieved of the burden of being the default uh, medium of communication. And now it can do all kinds of different things. So I think book culture is tremendously robust. It's more exciting than any time in the last couple of centuries. Uh, it's finding a strong resurgence in scholarly interest. Um, and it is, in comparison to digital media, 
an extremely sophisticated and um, admirable form. So the book can maintain backward compatibility for hundreds of years, whereas we know that digital software is lucky if we can do that, if it can do that for 10 years. So the book, in my view, is not going to disappear. The book is not going to become obsolete. But at the same time, what we mean by the book is changing. So in Mary Shelley's era, books were produced by letterpress, movable type. Currently, digital technologies completely interpenetrate the production of books. Books are uh, composed uh, in digital form. You transfer digital files to the press. Press sets it in digital form. Digital machinery is used for the production process. So it's more accurate now to say that the book is a particular output form of digital technology than it is a completely different uh, kind of object. Nevertheless, it has a strong cultural tradition that I think is more vibrant now than ever. More lights. Other questions? Would it be then hazardous to say, um, according to what you said about the relationship between the two Shelleys, that Mary Shelley, the writer, is the monster created by Percy Shelley? <laughs> well, um, you could say that, although I believe Mary came into her own. <laughs> she became her own monster. Um, does Shelley Jackson do anything in that text with the aspects of the novel in which it's harder to create the female monster? I mean, this didn't come up but uh, in, in our panels today, but so Victor seems fairly successful initially with the male monster, and then when he has to create the female version, he needs to go to experts in England because he doesn't have the knowledge of how to do it. <laughs> and then it, says, it all of a sudden, it's this totally new thing that he doesn't have the basic knowledge to do. I'm just wondering if she talks about that at all. Well, she doesn't talk about that, except that uh, she's always implicitly comparing the male monster and the female monster. And the female monster, as I mentioned, leaves Mary Shelley, goes off and has wonderful adventures and becomes a writer herself. So. Um, you mentioned how uh, in the computer version of the, uh, the her, Jilly Jackson's book, how uh, the thank you to the monster uh, to, uh, sorry, to uh, Mary Shelley, is only in the, the graph form, not in the uh, map form. And uh, I wanted to know what your take on that was. Like, was the, the graph uh, representative of something that the map wasn't? Or why did she choose to hide it? Well, uh, there's kind of a tradition in uh, the story space school of creating hidden lexias. And that's because the story space software allows what is called guard fields. So the writer, when the writer is composing Alexia, can choose to impose certain conditions on it that you cannot access that Alexia. It doesn't become visible to you until you've read a certain number of other Alexias. And the guard field, therefore, is a way to maintain some control over narrative sequence. And typically, the Alexias which are hidden are guard or guarded are extremely explosive lexias, where if you read them too early, it would uh, kind of uh, diffuse the climax of the work. So in uh, Michael Joyce's well-known hypertext, Afternoon, there's one particular lexia called White Afternoon that kind of reveals the secret of the narrative. You can't access that until you've gone through a certain number of other lexias. And I think that uh, Jackson was after a similar effect here by um, making the thanks Lexia visible only in a view that she knew most people wouldn't access unless they were really fanatic, like me. But. 
So it's a joke, in a way. In a way, it's a joke, but also it, it uh, reflects what, what's also in the narrative, that is that Mary and the monster become lovers. Unless you want to boom. Thank you, Professor Hales. Uh, I share with you fascination in uh, Shirley Jackson's figure of Mary Shelley feeling that she is in the gaps in between. And I'd like to ex see that conception expanded. It's basically a figure of a neural network, uh, or, or even, uh, uh, shall we say, the internet. Uh, uh, rhizomatic network structure, and it's almost a figure for a uh, conception of knowledge in the digital age where it's not so much the content of the nodes that are connected, but the, but the network of connections. Yeah, the links. Um, well, I, I agree with that, and when we remember that this work was created in well, published in 1995, which meant it was probably written in 94. The internet, or the World Wide Web, was really in its infancy yeah. in 1994. So, um, so it's kind of remarkable that Shelley Jackson picked up on that and then was able to incorporate that. I think it's clear from many places in her hypertext that she has in mind distributed cognition and with distributed cognition comes distributed agency. And that's sort of what she sees in the monster's ruptured, seamed, multiple body. I guess, if, could I ask you a question? Absolutely. Um, you were saying, you were at the, at the beginning, you sort of started by talking about um, the ways that the novel is, uh, that we don't notice it, right? That there are certain things about the novel that we don't notice. It's sort of sequential page numbers and um, these sort of very basic things. And then you sort of talked about the, the different form of subjectivity that Shelley Jackson displays in her, in her sort of experimentation with hypertext. And I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about what you mean by that difference between those two kinds of subjectivity. Like, is there a sort of subjectivity of the novel that is different from, from what Shelley Jackson is doing? And if you could sort of just be a little, say yeah. a little more about that. Well, I think that they're very different. So take, for example, the monster's narration in Mary Shelley's novel. He's remarkably eloquent. He conceives of himself as an agential subject capable of action. He presents himself as somewhat conflicted and yet with a unitary purpose, namely to find a mate. So he is a model of kind of uh, self-directed, self-willed, more or less coherent subjectivity. And the female monster, and if you remember the title page, uh, the subtitle is not now a modern Prometheus, it's a modern monster. Uh, is deliberately presented as a fragmented, distributed subjectivity. And um, as, as we were just saying, that's linked in Shelley Jackson's text to the form of writing that she's employing and the kind of uh, textual surface that she's creating. So what this suggests is that there are deep connections between uh, writing technologies and the way we envision subjectivities. And uh, that's part of Kittler's argument, of course. With the advent of the typewriter, for example, writers have a different relationship to their manuscript than they have if they're writing by hand. And his argument is that these effects have uh, both neurological consequences but also psychological consequences for the way one envisions one's subjectivity. Um, I'm going to, in a sense, apologize for my question because I'm going to move the target on you. Um, I am a medievalist, and I'm thinking of this story backwards. Um, medieval scribes fought with parchment, well, fought with um, um, 
parchment and papyrus, had to deal with handwriting, had to deal with the, the, the physical, mechanical stuff of literally putting the book together in a way that Shelley would not have, that would be handed up to somebody else. Um, but they were expected actually, more often than not, to remove themselves from any sub subjectiveness. The individual um, is often uh, kind of expressly shunted away. And um, one that strikes my mind, which might be more common than my students and I have read it, is to say the Canterbury Tales. Chaucer almost immediately points out, these aren't my stories. Let me tell you what I heard. Right. Um, which, in a way, it seems to me is what Shelley's doing. This isn't my story. This is Balt you know, she's removing herself a couple times. But they're obviously very much involved with the handwriting quality of it. So I'm just curious, and I understand, uh, given your, your great expertise in the field, what people might say actually looking backwards from Shelley in terms of writing technology rather than forward. Well, I think your point is very well taken, and it speaks to the importance of the context in which the writing artifact is embedded. So if you have a culture that de-emphasizes individuality and emphasizes collective action, we might suppose that to be true of monastery scribes, uh, for example, um, then that act of handwriting signifies differently than it would for a writer like Mary Shelley, who's now saying in the preface, her attempt and her husband's ambition for her is to, quote, enroll her in the page of fame. And that's a page of fame that, by the second edition, has her name on it. So I think you're, you're absolutely right to point to the importance of cultural context on what those different artifacts mean. They're, they're, giving you a, they're giving you a workout. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask you a little bit about uh, female sexuality and its uh, sort of transformation possibly since, or, or the way that it's seen since the um, publication of Shelley Jackson's book. Um, particularly, I was thinking, because you're um, right now at Duke, I was thinking of the uh, young woman from Duke who wrote recently <laughs> her journal, and I think she wrote it on Facebook, and it ended up being uh, posted online, uh, which concerned her sexual encounters and evaluations, the PowerPoint of each of the members of the lacrosse team, who male lacrosse team who she had uh, managed to seduce, and um, and yet critical articles written about you know her PowerPoint presentation seem to indicate that it's the same kind of uh, um, notion of female sexuality that she espouses you know through her writing that has existed for the last 200 years back to Mary Shelley. That is that although she presents herself as this figure of uh, sort of male, uh, a male paradigm of sexual conquest, in fact, she herself is um, uh, demeaned by her own um, uh, actions and her broken heart, etc. So just if you could comment on that. Sorry to pin you there because of your Duke affiliation. That happened before I went to Duke. <laughs> but uh, to take your question seriously, I think one momentous difference between contemporary female sexuality and uh, female sexuality as Mary Shelley experienced it is the issue of reproduction. So without a reliable method of birth control, sexuality for Mary Shelley had to be deeply bound up with uh, reproduction, babies, the death of her, her babies, and so forth. So there was a kind of a uh, dense psychological uh, complex there that uh, started in you know, her mother's death from her own childbirth, continued in her own adult life, where female sexuality was so deeply bound up with mortality. And, um, and that was especially true for Mary Shelley. I think it was true for all women of the time where childbirth was a very risky experience and contraception was either absent or uh, highly unreliable. And I think uh, young women like the woman at Duke that you mentioned are simply in a different place with regard to that. They have access to contraception. 
they can have hookups, as my students call them, without, uh, without uh, reproductive consequences, uh, although not necessarily without consequences. Um, and so that, I think, is one big difference between, uh, between the two. And it's always surprising to me how much um, sexual attitudes have this kind of regressive undertow to them, which you also alluded to in your comment. And it just uh, goes to show that social and cultural change is highly variegated. That is, at some levels it looks like there's a world of difference, and then at other levels you get that kind of regressive undertow that makes it not very different from Mary Shelley. I was wondering, while we're um, talking about gender, in Mary Shelley's novel, not only is her own woman's voice disguised through multiple male narrators, but it seems to me at least that the female characters are very thin, very two-dimensional, um, you know, uninteresting or, or caricatures as opposed to the, the greater psychological complexity of the different male figures. And I'm wondering what you make of that, whether it's intentional or unintentional, this uh, effacing or, you know, distorting yeah, I, of the I female presence. I would agree presence. with that characterization. And um, what, this is simply a, a hypothesis, a guess. I, I have, can't possibly substantiate this. But what I suspect is something like this. Mary Shelley is in this relationship with her husband. She's giving birth to herself as a writer in her first novel. She's very tentative about it. She doesn't know if she's going to be successful, but she's looking at people like Lord Byron, Percy Shelley, other luminaries of the circles in which they move, and she sees the men have this kind of overarching ambition, which she's not quite able to own herself. And therefore, she creates these male characters through which she can both explore the possibilities of such ambition and at the same time critique them. Because it seems to me very clear that her characterization of Victor in particular, but uh, Walton to some extent, are a deep critique of this kind of masculinist uh, mode of being in the world. Uh, but at the same time, she's, she's obviously fascinated by it. She's not creating the kind of female monster that Shelley Jackson is creating. So uh, I think you're right. She's not quite prepared to probe into the female psyche, which would be a more direct reflection of her in the same way she is in, in the male psyche. Other questions? Oh, great. Save, save you from running back and forth. <laughs> you, you, you mentioned briefly at one point the, the, the idea in Shelley Jackson of uh, the, the autonomy of the body parts, these, these subsystems that, that kind of have a life of their own. I was just curious whether she, does she do a lot with that? Is that just like a, a passing insight or does she play with that idea and, and take it in other places? Well, she plays with it extensively. In that section called Graveyard, we get the stories of the women who all contributed parts to the female monster. But in, um, in the large textual section called Body of Text, she is exploring that idea extensively about the body as a chimera, the text as a chimera, uneasy combination of parts and, uh, and so forth. So for example, in the Lexia Hazy Hole, W-H-O-L-E, uh, she has the comment that if you and I shake hands, I leave a few of my molecules with you, you donate a few molecules to me, and the idea here is that body boundaries are not secure, they're not definite, they're always in flux, and in Stitch Bitch, her essay, she also makes the comment, we have no idea what the body actually is. We know what the cultural image of the body is, but as far as the body itself, um, that's still terra incognita as far as she's concerned. 
going to add something now. <laughs> There's also something so fascinating about what you're saying Shelley Jackson does with um, if, if, all, if the female body is pieced together from parts of bodies that still maintain identities, of course, Frankenstein's creature is pieced together from these completely anonymous parts that we never, we never know anything about where these parts came from, right? Probably graves and you know, all sorts of creepy places. But we don't, we don't know, they're, they're all anonymous. Um, and I'm not exactly sure what my question is, but, but there's something in that move, there's something really fascinating about that, that sort of desire to name those parts of the body that come together. And I guess I wonder what you think Shelley Jackson is doing in deciding to give all well, those parts I, I names. Well, I think that's related to Shelley Jackson's idea of the deep nature of collaborative authorship. That even if one is composing a work by oneself with a computer, the computer is still mediating that in all kinds of obvious and not obvious ways. And it's interesting that we get in the uh, facsimile edition a vivid illustration of the compound nature of authorship as Mary Shelley's writing but Percy is changing things and adding words and crossing things out and so forth and yet when the novel is published in 1823 it has Mary Shelley's name on it and even though Percy wrote the 1818 preface it still has it's written as though it was the work of a single author namely the same author who wrote the novel so I think the, the idea of the intact body, the mo male monster's body with anonymous parts, goes along with the idea that you appropriate something else and now it's published under your name. And that's all part of a large legal, social, cultural complex having to do with copyright. So in uh, his fascinating book, Copyright and Owners, Mark Rose talks about how the formation of copyright and literary estate created the illusion of the man of genius. It was ultimately an economic imperative more than it was a cultural imperative, but by 1818, most of those cases had been settled, and now you get the firm notion of copyright as a belonging to a sole author. And it's interesting, even in our contemporary moment, that fiction is still maintained for legal purposes. So you sit through a film and you see hundreds of contributors to the film and then follows the statement, uh, Warner Brothers is the sole author of this film. <laughs> now it's obviously belied by the whole nature of filmmaking, but it uh, bespeaks to how, uh, how uh, uh, really uh, long-lasting that notion of the single author is. Well, thank you all. It's been a great pleasure. Thank you.